I am Jack's march toward enlightenment. Shit, I, I'm caught off guard. Uh, <laughs> I am Jack's. I am Jack's brand new toothbrush. I, I love this movie. I, I enjoy it too. Tomato meter is 43% with a 57% audience score. Holy smoly. I knew, you know what? I actually knew it was low. I mean, I, uh, I know that uh, some type of film festival, people were like not happy with it. Um, I think they just didn't understand it. And yeah, I get that. It took me a couple times to actually uh, really look at it with the drawings and the in the different books. I mean, it's a lot to take in, I guess, at first, because you're kind of like, you know, they're talking about, all right, there's three copies of it. They're all kind of the same book. And then that one guy wants to figure out which one is authentic out of the three so he could, you know, summon the devil. But then what's the, you know what, I'm, I'm actually trying to think of the, the plot here. I know um, there's a, you got to get all, all, all organize all those drawings together. And some are not not real, right? Yeah. Um, some are labeled LCF for Lucifer and some AT for Artistum Torquia. Artistum Torquia. That's the best. So one. basically you need Lucifer's signature on all nine and then you can summon him. Yeah. And he, I mean, he doesn't figure that out. I Something that attracts me a lot to this movie is he's a book detective. I didn't know that was a thing. And I think that's a awesome idea. He's moving around a lot. He's he's walking, he's going into phone booths, he's going back to the bookstore, he's going to different like I would say mansions or expensive houses and you like know countries flying all over the world and smoking a lot of cigarettes. Yeah. <laughs> Some mysterious girl uh you know everywhere he goes and and then there's people chasing him and What's the story on her? I mean, I guess I could kind of play a little bit because you. OK, so, um, you know, the, the uh, I guess that's Ernest or, or uh, yeah, Ernest Hemingway's daughter. Oh. Um, the blonde. Um, but she can float around. Yeah, there's that one scene where she's like, whoosh. She whatever. floats down. Yeah, I had to take a double take on that because it kind of is very subtle. You know, it just she's like not using the stairs anymore. <laughs> it's like kinda... some spiritual guide so okay so she's so she is she's not like the devil i mean she's not some people think that i kind of thought that you know um you know i showed you that little drawing that i did that had uh it's really weird because when you first look at it it doesn't seem as complex it is but i think what is that's probably nine dragon heads i think yeah and that's a lot like it doesn't seem like that. Um, and actually that drawing, when I was drawing it, you, when, when you draw something, you kind of absorb it like in a different way, but the, um, the uh, composition of it's, it's kind of, it's very well done. You know, the competition, comp uh, composition of the, the drag, the nine headed dragon, and then the nude woman reading the book. So it's like a, and that's her. That's the blonde. That's and then they end up having intercourse in the field with the burning building. All of the engravings look like the characters in the movie. Oh, they do. Mm -hmm. Okay, mumbo jumbo. It's yeah, <laughs> that's a great scene. Oh, uh, the, the scene. Oh, when uh, he kills her in front of the uh, in the yeah. audience. Yeah, there's always something very odd about. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to go off track real quick, but a couple weeks ago, you know, my mom was out. She said, uh, yeah, some uh, woman got raped in front of a bunch of people on a train and nobody did anything. They just watched the rape and it happened. And everybody this was in uh, Philadelphia, I think, a couple weeks, maybe about a month ago. And it makes and there's some uh, I knew an old friend from the newspaper, uh, Jonas Isotelo. Uh, he, he, he did, he studied upon that type of stuff when violence happens in groups and no, and it just continues. Like nobody does anything. They just watch. Actually, some people filmed it with their phones, but it's, it's, it's a weird feeling. Cause it's like group indifference for another human being. So that's kind of what was happening. He was hurting her like right in front of all those people. And it, eventually he killed her. Didn't he strangle her to death? 
there's just something extra disturbing when you have a, a, an audience that's indifferent and they're just watching and it just happens and you're like, damn, you know, it, three of those people could have like stopped it. Yeah. Stopped it easily. Well, and, uh, Dean Corso was trying to stop it, but the girl was holding him back. Yeah. So she must have, um, wanted, thought it would be better for everybody if she was the brunette with the, the blonde woman. I'm sorry, I don't know the character names. Probably thought it was better off in her spiritual intuition that that woman was dead. The the blonde woman doesn't have a name in the movie. She's the girl. Yeah. All right. I got something right there. <laughs> the, the no name and the brunette. Uh, I don't know, man. I, I have a soft spot. I, 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 thought, I think she's freaking gorgeous, that woman. And just her acting. So she acted under the Bergman guy. And I always want to say if it's Ingram or Ingrid, because I can't remember. There's also an actress kind of with a similar name, but uh, apparently they're they're They have kind of an unorthodox school of acting and a lot of Bergman's or is it Bergman? Uh, films are in the criterion collection. So she comes from that criterion collection, you know, whatever. So I, I don't know. I just, but I, anytime she's on, when I throw that movie in the background and I, <laughs> and I hear her voice, man, I stop what I'm, I always just look back because I, I think she's very, just uh, a very attractive woman. So it's the book is the nine gates of the kingdom of shadows mm. written in 1666 by the fictional artisanum Torquia. I can't pronounce that. And the, uh, the movie basically follows the order of the engravings. Is it a real book? No. Okay. Now, this movie is actually based off of a book by Arturo Perez Riverta. He wrote the book The Club Dumas in 1993. Mm, okay, and so pretty recent. It's, it's different than the movie, but a lot of the same themes are in there. I, I know I pointed this out before, but yeah, they, they, uh, Johnny Depp does. Uh, he smokes a lot of cigarettes and he yeah. he drinks the booze, little shots of stuff. And I, I, I always was just like, remember when he might I know this is like just kind of frivolous, I guess. But the little things sometimes he just throws a box of TV dinner and nukes it. Did they ever have that where you didn't have to take it out of the wrap or anything? You could just nuke a box. No, I know. Like, I, I mean, I know that's kind of like they're, they're, they're trying to do character development. Like, all right, this guy's just kind of like, he's got that. He's an anti-hero. Yeah. He's got that side. Yeah. He's Question got that side to him. Yeah. But I know it also tracks because, you know, even even you said that's a really cool job to be a book de detective. And I, I've always been drawn. I, you know, we have a Barnes and Nobles. I've worked at two bookstores myself. I've always been drawn to bookstores. We don't have them like you. I, I guarantee like, you know, your neck of the woods and probably more in the older northern United States probably has really cool old bookstores. We have some cool uh, like, you know, small used book bookstores that are yeah. always neat because you never know what you're going to find and a lot of my books come i used to go to goodwill a lot people oh, would wow. you know you get wealthy people or students and they'll read a book and just donate it because they don't want to keep them around or whatever so like i was finding um i have a large stephen king collection and when i'd find like a first edition or even a second edition i'd replace whatever edition i have with that first edition and uh, it's always cool. So there's just something special about physical books, even though I read more digital these days because of the convenience. Um, I agree with that. I want to um, board books for some reason. Also, there's something about a bookshelf filled with books. I don't know what the actual, you know what I mean? I mean, even if you go to a stranger's house or you see it at somebody's house or uh, there is just something very... Uh, um, I don't know. I almost want to say heavenly, you know, like about a bookshelf, you know, filled with books, you know, we had somebody, well, I'll, I'll cut this out, but one time we had uh, a woman, my wife is like, like her degrees are in early childhood education. 
and she would take on uh basically private people to you know to watch in our home or whatever years ago before we had three kids but we had one. i didn't even know you had three kids that's wow i thought you had two wow we had one uh, a lady come over with her kid and she like looked at my bookshelf and then we never heard from her again <laughs> Don't take that part out, man. Leave that. I have to say leave that. <laughs> that's, that's a good book collection then at that point. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's crazy because it's books. Do I bring up the director? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I am a fan of all of uh, Polanski's films and there was a lot of Polanski-ish type of, uh, you know, the cinematography. Um I wrote down nothing too special, just enough to convey the right perspective for capturing the motion being conveyed. I guess I'll agree with that because I'm not I'd like, there's no scenes that are like popping out my brain besides the bookstores mm. or that book or that one particular bookstore. And, uh, in Spain. Yeah. Maybe just not even that much. Um, probably uh, more like interior shots of the hotel. And I like hotels. So anytime I see that, and, and, you know, I, I like, I really envy being like 22 years old and just going to a hotel bar and actually ordering like a Roman Coke and smoking cigarettes. I don't do that really anymore, but, uh, you can anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when I see that I, I envy, sometimes I envy the anti-heroes vices cause, uh, right. I so used to love you. a, when we a were cigarette young, and listen watching kyler he also did um coppola's dracula hmm. and i, I wrote a lot of music but when there is it adds to the drama and it's very beautiful um the the number oh, like i oh, sound like jim morrison that number the number um the number that usually kind of goes more like when he's moving like going from a to B or whatever. It, it again reminds me sort of a little bit like Ghostbusters. Like it's just kind of uppity, puts you kind of like in a, you know, like the guy's on an adventure, he's on a mission, and mm. the music uh kind of kind of carries him, and then it goes with his wit and sarcasm a little bit. The nine LCF engravings show the path into or out of the realm of shadows. It's not really about summoning the devil at all, it is for Boris Balkan. But for Corso, it's not, who is our hero, actually. It's about exiting the evil of money and power and playing by the rules. So uh, in modern religion in the United States, rejecting money and power is kind of seen as evil often. And Dean Corso is the hero and Balkan is the bad guy. Now, duality is a heavy, heavy theme and probably the main theme of this entire movie. Uh, you have Boris Balkin and Liana Telfer and then Dean Corso and the girl. Um, both Boris and Corso solve the nine gates, but Boris did not follow the rules and was in it for materialistic gains and thus fell to his fiery doom in hell. Corso followed the rules and went through the light into God's grace. And the quote I put down is from the movie. What are you looking for, Mr. Corso? And he says, I'm not quite sure. So this first gate is titled silence is golden. And a knight rides through a fortified town with his finger on his lips. He counsels prudence or silence. So in the AT version, the castle has four towers. In the LCF, the castle has three towers. Uh, another translation of the Latin there at the bottom is only one who has battled according to the rules will prevail. The castle in the image is the final destination. And this has significance in regards to the final outcome of the ninth gate. Um, number four is the physical domain. There are four phases of the moon, four cavities in the human heart, four limbs, four points of the compass and of the cross used to crucify Christ, four known physical forces, uh, nuclear radiation, gravity and electromagnetism. And in some cultures, it considered an unlucky or tricky number. 
So the number three is the realm of the spirit and perfection, the Holy Trinity, mind, body, and soul, birth, life, and death, consciousness, subconscious, and physical form. Uh, most significant is that the number three represents new and challenging adventures with an assurance on cooperation from others whom you may require help. Consider the exploits Corso becomes involved in and the mysterious woman who joins his side. Typically, the number three symbolizes reward and success in most undertakings. So right from the very outset, the first gate describes the final outcome will be either material or spiritual will bring good fortune or bad luck, depending on which path is taken. Again, duality. We start to see the paths of Balkan and Corso. One is doing it for knowledge. And even eventually, Dean Corso uh, stops caring about the money aspect. And he's just, like, he starts caring. His character development is good. While as Boris Balkan, uh, Balkan wants to kind of cheat the system. And uh, he's not actually doing the nine gates. He's having somebody else do it. And with his money and power, he thinks he can um, like reap the rewards of this without actually doing it. Right. So the second gate is open that which is closed a hermit before a closed door, a lantern on the ground, and two keys in his hand. Next to him, a sign that resembles the Hebrew letter Tet. The AT version, keys are in the right hand. The LCF, keys in his left hand. Uh, keys refer to salvation or damnation. They're highly prized in occult circles. King Solomon's temple had two doors and also two doors to its oracle. Two keys are required for the outer doors, a golden key for the right door and a silver key for the left door, right hand, left hand. Some keys are used on the inner doors, but they are turned from left to right instead of from right to left. This defines duality of the nature of these objects. Right can be left or sorry, right can be light. Light can be dark, you know, right and left, light and dark. Whichever hand is used will determine how the door is open and what route is unlocked to the seeker of material power or enlightenment and knowledge. Uh, Fargus, the old man in Portugal, had almost lost everything but still kept those two crystal glasses. And when they go back to visit him, uh, like there's a shot of the glass smashed on the ground. And then they, he, Corso, finds the book in the fire. The third gate, wasted breath keeps a secret. So a traveler heads towards a bridge which spans a river. At each end, a fortified door bars access. On a cloud, a bowman aims in the direction of the road leading to the bridge. On the AT version, the bowman has one arrow, loaded and ready, pointing down. On the LCF version, the bowman has a second arrow, this one in the quiver, pointing up. Uh, another translation of the Latin there at the bottom is a missing word keeps a secret kind of um, foreshadowing like that. The ninth page is actually missing because those two guys put a forgery for the ninth key and he goes back and he actually finds the page. They're all missing in the book store and that page falls off a bookshelf and that's how he gets the, the final real page of the ninth, the ninth key. So, um, you know, with the arrow pointing up and the arrow pointing down represents um, kind of God and the devil duality. Uh, the, the person who dares to seek to penetrate the boundaries of his powerful domain, who dares to grasp the hidden meanings to unlock the gates of secrecy. And it, it's also kind of a stark warning. Um, the river represents a boundary and transcendence. It is strength and calamity. And so the bowman also represents Eros or Cupid, who has gone through many reinterpretations, shooting his golden arrow to inspire love. Um, but with two arrows, there's also the risk of hatred. The bowman holds more than a striking resemblance 
to the 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 brothers that were in the the shop. Um, it is they who have removed one of the Lucifer engravings that we talked about and replaced it with a forgery. They represent the missing word that perpetuates the secret, the missing engraving, which they actually concealed in their shop. And as Corso leaves their shop in Toledo, danger descends upon him from above. The, the scaffolding falls, uh, basically signifying that he didn't acquire the missing page. The fourth gate, chance is not the same for all. So a jester before a stone maze, the entrance is closed by a door. Three dice on the ground each reveal their faces. And when you add up the faces on each of those dice, you get six, 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 which is kind of interesting. Um, so in the AT, that exit is bricked up. And in the LCF, it's open. A maze um, has potent symbolism. In Greek mythology, the labyrinth of Crete was so well designed that it was impossible for a person to find their way out again, leaving them as prey for the Minotaur. The Minotaur represents the beast inside of all of us that roams the labyrinth of the subconscious mind. The warning here is delve into the darker side of yourself and you may never find a way back out. In Torquia's version, there is no way out. Um, the Minotaur is uh, very near but also alien to us. Um, the emblem of the unity of the human and inhuman. The duality of the good nature and the bad. The story of the Ninth Gate is suggestive of a maze where the protagonist Corso reaches clear junctions of choice to retreat or go forward, to deceive or be honest, to kill or let live. All the while, Corso is being drawn deep and deeper into the mystery. Uh, what is that will lead him out the other side? Um, the exit is open for the LCF plate. And... Uh, the mysterious woman is helping him help guide him really. So it's, it's her help. So the, the dice actually signify chance also, you know, there's a little bit of luck in taking this journey. So like others may have probably taken it in the past, but it just, the chaos and luck of reality just didn't allow it yet. So the fifth gate is entitled in vain. A merchant counts his gold. Death holds an hourglass in one hand and a pitchfork in the other. In AT's version, the hourglass has just begun to flow, but in Lucifer's, the hourglass has stopped flowing. Um, this might be inside the, the ninth gate. Um, the floor is a checkerboard. Again, duality, black and white. And uh, the hourglass and the pitchfork in either hand are significant. Pitchfork is three-pronged, a trident, um, like Neptune, um, and later adopted for the devil. Although it is also a weapon against evil in Hinduism, uh, with powers against demons. In this engraving, the conclusion has been reached. The merchant has acquired much material wealth with no real reward at all. He has not seen that only time stands between him and the devil or death. Uh, in Torquia's version, there is still time to resolve the situation, to dispense the material delusions of wealth, and to take the appropriate action. So the sixth gate is I enrich myself with death. And in the movie, his friend is hung like this. The, the bookshop owner. He finds him hung upside down just like this. A hangman similar to that of the tarot, his hands behind his back hung by one foot from the crenellation of the castle wall next to a closed tower gate. A hand clad in a gauntlet brandishes a burning sword. 
So in AT's version, the man hangs from his right foot. Lucifer's, the man hangs from his left. Despite hanging upside down, the man's hair and clothes do not. He has a calm demeanor. This position is desired by this man. Um... A, a, a key meaning of the hangman is that through personal sacrifice and even death comes new understanding. The Norse god Odin hung upside down from the world tree Yggdrasil for nine days in order to obtain wisdom. By passing through these nine days of challenge or nine gates, Odin acquired the runes from the well of word, the source and end of all sacred knowledge. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the Tree of Life, Genesis 3.24. So you see, these things uh, have been in religion forever, you know. The significance of the right and left leg is based on the motivation and nature of the sacrifice being undertaken. Torquia's engraving showing the man hanging from the right leg would suggest a materialistic sacrifice. But the inverted meaning can indicate the opposite is true, just as with the gold and silver keys of the temple um, of Solomon, you know, duality again. The alternate engraving demonstrates a spiritual sacrifice, a surrender of oneself to acquire sacred knowledge as opposed to material. The seventh gate, uh, the disciple outshines the master. A king and a beggar play chess on a board with white squares. The moon can be seen through the window, and beneath this and next to a closed door, two dogs are fighting. On ATs, the squares of the chessboard are all black. On Lucifer's, they're all white. The crescent moon symbolizes new beginnings and the turning of dreams into reality. So uh, to take a, a slight detour... And a lot of people probably won't want to hear this, but Lucifer's only mentioned once in the Bible, and it means light bearer. Uh, the world has created an entire mythos around the devil and Lucifer all being the same thing and blah, 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 blah. But it, it just depends on what you believe, I guess. And... Uh, like Lucifer was fallen from grace because he cared more about the humans than God did, some say, right? And being the light bearer, so white light and black being lack of light. So a king and a beggar are playing chess, but they are equal in this situation. It's saying it doesn't matter if you're a king or a beggar. That if your intentions are right and you're seeking the right knowledge uh, and not materialistic or money or power, uh, that you can achieve uh, a higher understanding of, of everything. Um, this is virtue is conquered. And this is where... Corso was examining the third book and he gets smacked on the back of the head and knocked out before the fortified walls of a castle, a figure in prayer whilst behind him stands a warrior with a mace ready to strike in the background is the wheel of fortune in a T version. The warrior does not have a halo around his head, but in the LCF, the warrior does have a halo around his head. So the virtuous man prays to overcome the challenges he faces, but fate may still strike him down. A killing blow from the warrior behind him, pending on the turn of the wheel of fortune. Virtue will not stop the praying man from being killed. Virtue is defeated. The warrior and the man in prayer represent the dual roles of the protagonist and antagonist, Corso and Balkan. One is aggressive, acquisitive, determined to do whatever to achieve his goal. The other is passive and seeking guidance to gain an understanding of his goal. Yet the engraving by Lucifer shows the warrior with a halo around his head, symbolizing that the warrior may also be virtuous, but his high moral standards do not stop him killing. The notion and potential of virtue being conquered is seen to rotate through both figures, duality. Now the ninth gate. I know now that the shadows come from the light. 
So I would argue that the the gates are to escape the shadows. So we are in the shadow world. And when he walks in the building at the end into the light, he's escaping the shadow world, this world of fakeness and materialistic and um, ultimately to his enlightenment. And uh, a seven headed dragon being ridden by a naked woman and then Corso gets ridden by the girl. Um, she has an open book in her lap and gesturing towards the, the castle in the background. Um, in the AT version, the castle is in flames. In the LCF, a starburst of intense light radiates from behind the castle. So again, Balkan misinterprets it and ends up burning in hell, setting himself on fire where the with guidance and inquisitiveness and a seek for truth and knowledge corso walks through to the light and becomes enlightened into heaven um So this building is actually in France, and I'd like to visit there someday. In Balkan's copy of the Nine Gates, whom he acquired from Telfer, who, in two, uh, who bought it from the Seneza twins, it's a forgery made to look like the others, um, the castle in flames. This leads Balkan to make the fatal error of mistaking fire to be a part of the ritual of the Nine Gate, uh, and so leads to his rather grisly ending and his descent into hell. Duality again. Um, and, and what Balkan says is kind of interesting. So, by a long... Oh, to travel in silence by a long and circuitous route. Shit, I don't know. <laughs> To brave the arrows of misfortune, to fear neither noose nor fire, to play the greatest game of all games, and win for going no expense, is to walk the vicissitudes of fate and gain at last the key that will unlock the ninth gate. And he, he was wrong. He cheated. Um, he didn't play by the rules, which was in one of the actual engravings itself. Like you, in the very first one, you have to play by the rules. And so. It's, it's pretty pretty amazing. And I, I hope by people who see this may actually like walk away with a new appreciation and want to watch this movie a little more. What do you think about all that crap I just said? <laughs> I don't, it was excellent, man. And I can't imagine anybody that is watching this would not want to watch the movie after that. Uh, unbelievable. Um, and yeah, I didn't know. Now I want to watch it again with a, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 that's the, uh, you just provided like, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting what movies are like, you know, in creative writing, we get command, we get visual prompts and then in movies, you know, they write storyboards. This is like a movie almost that follows like these nine drawings. Like you just kind of presented it like a visual art presentation, um, which is very interesting you know, kind of, uh, it's kind of like the storyboarding, um, being, yeah. And that's, then, that's very unique. If you think about it, I don't know too many movies that do that, you know, that have the right. Um, and the fact is, uh, I learned this from Robert Crumb, but I don't know. I almost want to say it's, uh, George Gross and a few other ones. He would take uh, a magnifying glass and he would go over the old medieval art and some of those, a lot of those artists and stuff. And uh, let me fix this. Um, he would discover things. So when you go through, that's exactly what it reminded me of. And I really enjoyed the, uh, my favorite one's the beggar and the knight playing chess. Um, it's just, there's something about that one. But, you know, if you take a magnifying glass and you kind of go through things, you'd be able to see a lot of artists, even back then, put little Easter eggs. 
So there's a lot of really cool stuff with this movie and these drawings. And I think your fascination, probably obsession, healthy obsession is uh, apparent. And uh, I, I think Polanski, who should be in jail for a little bit, um, would appreciate and same, same with the, whoever produced it, your analysis of it. Um, it's very good, man. Uh, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you said a lot, man. Uh, yeah. And, you know, the... Uh, Oh, that's very cool, man. Um, yeah, it's really neat how ingenious, and it's. I think it's the original book that that writer deserves that credit, is like not only do the engravings dictate the story, but like also everything. So like you said storyboarding, so it's like almost he could have just came up with the engravings and then wrote the whole story around them. Yep, 100%. I just you know? learned today that medieval drawings, like they drew certain animals really weird because they they'd never seen them in real life. And oh, they cool. Only, and and then like so somebody would be um paid to to draw a giraffe or a camel and they're like, "Oh, it has a long neck and and a hump." And then so it looks like it turns into a Baranosaurus basically because they've never actually seen a camel and they can't Google it. And then, so people these days are like, Oh, there were, there was people with Baranosauruses. No, no, no. <laughs> they just never actually saw a camel. And so that's why we get medieval drawings and stuff with like tiny orgies and shit and like weird animals we're not familiar with, <laughs> you know, and like, they they they're like, well, I need to imagine a sheep. I bet it looks like a lion or something. You know, like you get it. Um, it's kind of interesting you said that because probably like a week ago, Doctor Jessica Labby, I follow her on, you know, she's fr friends with her on Facebook. She pa posted a famous painting by a famous artist, and the cat looked weird. It had human eyes, and she goes, "I don't care what y'all say. This artist has never seen an actual cat in their life." This was drawn from, so I'm wondering, you know, I mean, I don't know how much, you know, cats were roaming around. I'm assuming this was somewhere probably, I mean, Europe, you know, was he out, you know, didn't travel and, and just heard about cats. And was that a similar painting? Probably it was, about them and it was a whacked out looking cat, man. It was not like anything. It had kind of human eyes that, you know, the ears, you, you know, anybody could kind of draw a little bit of a cat. They know this was, you know. And the fa human face was perfect, but the cat, <laughs> I laughed. I must've laughed for 10 minutes because she goes, um, no, this artist has never seen a cat. So it's exactly it, man. Uh, oh, where are we at? Okay. So 4.99 will be my final answer. And that comes after, um, hearing your, uh, analysis interpretation of the, you know, the nine gate drawings and the uh, theme of the duality. And uh, what, just real quick though. So you're saying in the Bible that the devil is mentioned once and the devil's like a source of light. Uh, Lucifer actually translates to light bearer. And these only mention one spot in the Bible. Wow. Now, now the word devil is used other times in different parts of the Bible and demon and other parts and and actually god uh, the bible doesn't even have one god it actually has like a whole bunch of them the elohim when you start if you dig into hebrew and then start actually getting into like the history of the bible the bible's even been edited up until the 1950s they change things in the Bible that we know today. And then you have the children's Bible and then churches don't even teach what's actually in the Bible. Like most people don't even know that the word, do you, th do you uh, the word apocalypse is never in the Bible. The word rapture is never used in the Bible. The idea isn't even in the Bible at all. 
but like later people were like explaining shit and it became like things that were taught. It's really weird. Well, you know, we, I did that drawing thing not too long ago. The, uh, I had no idea about what the angels look like when I think it was Genesis or the garden of Eden, you know, um, not even any real description on the serpent, you know? Um, and, uh, that's why I drew that angel, which was uh, what a four well, see, heads, couple wings. The four thing pairs. Is, it's just a snake. It's not actually the devil. There's no mention of it actually being the devil. And in the Hebrew, it's literally just a snake. Hmm. So it's it's fascinating what we've done, what people have twisted and changed in Christianity and Judaism. Yeah. 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, even. I mean, even the the appearance of Christ doing that drawing, somebody that was more dark, olive skinned and, um, you know, not this. That was the, the image we know today is thought to be Caesar Borgia, who was Leonardo da Vinci's boyfriend. And that's where the modern light skinned white Jesus comes from. If you go look at images of Caesar Borgia, you're like, that's fucking Jesus. Hmm. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, we could even throw in uh, the evolution of like Santa Claus. There are similarities. You know, I mean, it just comes to where an artist or a few artists grab mm-hmm. hold of an uh, image. You ever seen Zeitgeist? That sounds familiar. So the... Da Vinci was a genius, right? And the Last Supper, there it's the original. Like, why does Jesus have 12 disciples? Because Jesus represents the sun and the 12 constellations in the sky and the path of the sun through those constellations. And literally, S U N S O N, the light of the earth, like. We personify, humans personify everything. Now, it doesn't mean that it's not all true. You're allowed to believe whatever you want. Like, I'm not saying that. But, like, historically, uh, December 25th was also the birthday of Mithras. It was also the birthday of Dionysus, Apollo, um, Osiris, or uh, uh, not Osiris, but... uh, um, um, Osiris, Isis, and their son, whose name is blanking me right this minute. But when you go back in history, we have like 10,000 years of, of written history in the East, and then only about 3,000 in the West. And uh, the cuneiform tablets, um, there's a story of Anki and Inlil and... Uh, there's like a that like all of these stories have exactly the same thing as Christianity. All they did was steal ideas from past religions, kind of wrap them up in Rome. Like our shit comes from Rome. And then think about there's 70 versions of the Bible. There are uh, a thousand different types of Christianity. Baptist, Lutheran, Martinist, none of them believe the same shit. Fuck, not even two people that sit in the same church their entire life believe the same things. Yep. So your own, like ultimately your own relationship with the divine is your own. Like, there's probably nobody ever that will agree with you about any of Your it. own personal Jesus. Yeah. On. The history of mankind is interesting. And it's like, even Jesus, when you just read the red, red letters in the red letter Bible, uh, do your research about Gnosticism and the gospel, the Gnostic gospels, and you read some of these uh, scrolls they found in Qumran in the, in the fucking caves um, that are like as old as Christianity but they're not canonical. They're non-canonical. And they say shit like, you don't need church. You don't need, you know, God is everywhere. Why, you know, like 
and and it's about enlightenment and experience and like the material world is fucking all bullshit and you know we shouldn't have to worry about that stuff we could have a utopia but people as a species we're still pretty fucking evil and selfish we haven't evolved enough to really be better and technology really makes us think we are higher beings than we really are. We're still very animal-like. Well, we could go back to Dune, which is, I don't know how many <laughs> years in the future that is, but the whole thing is uh, one of the, uh, one of the ideas is we don't, we haven't evolved no matter what we're flying around in space, eating this spice, traveling way in the future. Technology is unbelievable, but we're still the same. Where is my mind? Where is my mind? Where is my mind? Way out in the water, sit swimming.